Again, thank you for that beautiful, reflective opening to this service. It was lovely. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this church, Presbyterian Church in Creef, which has stood here for almost 200 years, proclaiming God's presence among us. It's wonderful. Today, we give thanks for all of God's blessings. Next week, you will have uh, Rev Reverend Jeff with you, and he will lead a service in Holy Communion. So if you're a fo strict follower of the Revised Common Lectionary, which I doubt many of you are. I actually switched readings today with, with um, Reverend Jeff because uh, today's readings were supposed to be Corpus Christi, which is the body of Christ, which is Holy Communion. So I switched the readings with him. So if you're a really strict follower of Revised Common Lectionary, you won't find it today. <laughs> so... Um, I also, this is going to be my <clears throat> last time here before the summer and until who knows when. So I do pray that you have a safe, fun, and happy summer as you approach um, the end of school and hopefully time with grandchildren and all of that good stuff. So I wish all of that to you. And also welcome to all of you who are watching through our video feed. Um, so the peace of Christ be always with you. I invite you to pass the peace of Christ to your neighbor. The call to worship is on the screen. Let us give thanks to God with our whole hearts. Call upon God to increase our strength of soul. So we gather to worship God, trusting in God's goodness and guidance. We come to offer our prayers and praise. We acknowledge the goodness of God. Our first hymn is number 490, God of Grace and God of Glory, and it's on the screen. Thank you. 
we pray. Open our eyes to your purposes for each of us and all of us, and for the church in every location. As we gather this morning, awake us with insights from your Holy Spirit, and show us how to fulfill your will in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. May we confess our sins. Prayer of confession is on the screen. God, we come before you knowing that without you, we are in, unworthy to enter your presence. We confess that we often complain about things in our lives without recognizing that when we do, we complain against you alone. We are sorry for the times when we don't see your blessings and we fail to give to others out of love about the provisions you give to us. May we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we pray an assurance of pardon. The prophet Micah reminds us that God requires three things of us. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. To all who turn away from self-interest and seek reconciliation with God and neighbor in kindness and humility, we can be assured that God offers forgiveness and peace. Now, we'll sing this next song, but there are no children today. Okay, I might do the children's time anyway. <laughs> I'm going to live so God can use me. We'll just sing the whole thing through. And instead of verse 1 and 2 and then 3 and 4. And um, I just wanted to show everybody, the children anyway, this wonderful picture of my family at a family reunion in probably, judging by my son's age now and there, was probably in about 1986. <laughs> anyway, we sat out on the rocks in front of our cottage and my father timed the timer on the camera and we all tried to smile and the wind was blowing like crazy and the waves were rocking like crazy and we had this beautiful picture taken of the family and i was going to tell the kids that we are all adopted members of the family of god and although we have family reunions to remind us of the ties that we have with our family this is a family reunion as well to remind us of our ties in the family of god so that's 
the children's focus. <laughs> I just love that picture. Because it was so spontaneous, it was just lovely. May we pray. Loving God, our souls wait for you more than those who watch for the morning. Send your spirit to open your word for us so that we will hear your voice and follow Christ, your living word. Amen. And now I'm going to invite Judy up for the readings. So the first scripture reading is Samuel 1, verses, uh, or Samuel, yeah, 1, chapter 8, verses 4 to 20. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a new king to lead. Lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said, God, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not that you have, they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. They will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your male and female servants, and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourself will become his slaves. When the day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all other nations with the king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. And the response of Psalm, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart before the gods, and I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness, for you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpassed your fame. When I called you, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. The lofty he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, 
your preserve my life. You preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes, and with your right hand you save me. And the second reading is from Corinthians chapter 4, or Corinthians 4, uh, chapter 13, verses 5 to 1. No, that's not quite right, but anyway. Corinthians 4, verse 13 to chapter 5, verse 1. Got it. <laughs> okay. It's all going to sound the same anyway. <laughs> It's written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who has raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the Lord of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and our momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory, that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen in temporary, but what is unseen is eternal, awaiting the new body. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, No one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth. All the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A 
I pray that I speak to you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wine, wine, wine. It seems that the Israelites had the corner on whining. Way back to when, Jesus, when Moses tried to lead the ungrateful throng out of Egypt, where they were slaves to Pharaoh, there was sniveling and complaining. Today we read about them whining again, and this time it's to Samuel. They were complaining that they didn't have a king like all the other nations. They were whining because they didn't recognize their status as God's chosen people. They just recognized that they weren't like everybody else. They'd had God as their so sovereign ruler. They'd lived in a theocracy where God assigned judges like Samuel to whom he spoke and through whom he governed. And yet, they didn't give thanks. They complained. The nation was prospering. But we all know what happens when nations prosper. And it usually doesn't involve gratitude. Instead, they either take credit for their good fortune or they get complacent. They take the things they've been given for granted and compare themselves to what others have. They become covetous, wanting more of what they think is good for them. So the Israelites looked around at other nations and thought, they were being hard done by because they didn't have a head of state. All they could focus on was the fact that they were the only ones that didn't have someone with a crown on their head to rule them. So they whined to Samuel. Samuel was understandably upset with them, and he took the problem, as he always did, directly to God. Samuel felt like a failure because he thought the people were rebelling against him, that perhaps he should have retired earlier, or maybe he was missing the boat somehow. But God assured Samuel that the people had complained against God from the beginning of time, and it wasn't getting any better. God must have been extremely disappointed in them. I think just as he had been with Adam and Eve and at the time of Moses, he was feeling betrayed by his people, and God knew that this was not the end of human betrayal and desertion. He knew he would experience it again and again. God knew that in the person of Jesus, he would suffer the pain of being whipped, scourged, and hung on a cross at the hands of his own children, those he created in his own image and loved beyond measure. The desertion, the betrayal of his beloved children resulted in a feeling of utter desolation and yet somehow God continued to love them just as he loves us. It's easy to look back at the Israelites and criticize them, but we're not much better than they. When we think we have everything as individuals and as a nation, we start complaining about and picking away at what we have. You'll see this behavior in the church as much as anywhere else. For example, there's excitement as a new minister takes the pulpit. But after a few months, after the honeymoon period is over, the person lets us down somehow. They're not preaching the way we think they should. They don't make pastoral calls to the congregation. They aren't that great with the youth. Or maybe it's the elderly or perhaps married couples, or maybe it's singles, you name it. And they take five weeks vacation, for heaven's sakes. Whether in the church, in the nation, or as individuals, we don't seem to be content with life. And when we're not content, we have to realize at some point that we're not, reject, we're not respecting and honoring and being grateful for the things that we have been given and given to us by God himself. It's ultimately God who provides for us. If we're living in a wonderful country full of freedoms with relatively good health care and social safety nets, we can thank God for his blessing upon us and upon this country. We need to do what we are commanded to do. When we're discouraged with the way things are being governed or the way things are going in our lives, we need to turn away from complaining and turn the complaints into prayers. 
Especially, we need to pray for our leaders. And as Paul tells us, we need to give thanks for all things in all circumstances because this is God's will for us. So, the Israelites asked for a king. And when God responded to the prayers of Samuel, it's what he didn't say that was really amazing. He didn't say no. He didn't say they couldn't find a king. What he did say to Samuel was, if that's what they want, they should have it. Warn them, though, Samuel, about what will happen. The king will make them slaves. The king will tax them. The king will take them into battle with other lands. The king will serve himself and not them. They will make up a part of his labor force. It will be like they were back in Egypt under slavery all over again. But God allowed them to go ahead and find a king if that's what they chose. So the people of Israel, despite the warnings, insisted on a king, and God commissioned Samuel to find one for them. One of God's abiding principles is that he gives us free choice. He does not force or pressure us to love him. He never has. He beckons us. If we are willing, he directs us and guides us and rules over us if we acknowledge God's right to rule. And through all of our choices in life, he loves us. He tends to our needs, whether we've made good or bad choices. The rain falls and the sun shines on the wicked and the good. He invites us and he courts us, but he never courses us. He didn't force the Israelite people either. They made a choice and chose to have a human king rather than the king of kings and lord of lords as their leader. They turned their back on God, and at the end of the passage, God said to them, this is your choice. Don't come whining to me if things go wrong. Just like any parent might say to a child who, after hearing and receiving good advice, still goes off to do their own thing. Don't come complaining to me if things don't turn out. Choice is a terrible responsibility. We are the sum total of every choice we have made in life. It is the choice to follow God or to disregard him that determines our ultimate destiny. destiny. If choosing a human king, in choosing a human king, the Israelites were unwittingly dividing their house. They were aligning themselves with other nations that did not live by God's principles and in so doing were breaking their close connection to God. If you can believe it, in our gospel passage today, the teachers of the law accused Jesus of the same thing. They said that he was not acting according to God's will. A situation is described where Jesus enters a house probably to get food for him, himself and his disciples and find some peace and quiet. But crowds of people surrounded him. So Jesus, with the compassion he always demonstrated, began to heal the people and to drive out demons. But the delegation from the synagogue, and don't they show up everywhere, accused him of being on the payroll of Beelzebub, Satan, the father of lies. Jesus pointed out that Satan would never drive out his own army of demons. Demons and evil spirits do the job they are assigned, harassing and terrorizing God's people. Satan and his cohorts are smarter than the people of God in that respect. They stick together and follow the will of their master. Satan's chief goal, goal is to ruin the faith of the people that God has created. If Satan can wreck Rick wreak, sorry, wreak havoc on our, on our well-being, he will undermine our ability to minister to others in the name of Jesus. Satan hates the fact that God loves us. He's jealous of our position in God's kingdom as redeemed and sanctified, and he will do everything in his power to destroy us. Jesus knew this. He knew that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus did not want anyone to misinterpret by whose authority he healed people, by whose power he forgave them. It was by the power of the Holy Spirit, not an evil spirit. To misrepresent the Holy Spirit's power as power coming from Satan, 
to equate the spirit of God with Beelzebub was the ultimate blasphemy. God always shows a united front, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in relationship. The Israelites didn't realize when they wanted to choose a king that they were falling into the hands of the father of lies. They didn't appreciate the house of Israel was becoming divided, no longer a nation under God's direct rule. God wanted them to recognize his hand of protection on them, but the Israelites once more rejected his governance. And yet, despite God's threatening not to listen when they came to him with their troubles, we know that God is loving and compassionate and that he forgives us. If we chose, choose to come to him in prayer, he will listen to us. Our psalm assures us that when we call on God, God answers and helps us to make us bold and stout-hearted. God's love endures forever. And Jesus tells us that all our confessed sins will be forgiven. God will listen to us and forgive us because he himself would provide the way for this to happen. We just need to make a choice of who we will follow. The letter of Paul to the Corinthians is so clear on this. Paul was late into the fold of the apostles. He had persecuted Jesus by seeking Christians in order to have them taken to trial and stoned to death for their faith. But in this letter, he's saying, through the spirit of faith, he believed. It didn't matter that he had persecuted Jesus, doubted, and betrayed him. God would still, through the spirit of grace, forgive and equip Paul for ministry. God allowed Jesus to suffer and die, and then he raised him up to his rightful place on a heavenly throne. And those who believe will also be raised up after they die to be in the presence of God. Once we understand this magnificent gift, our thankful hearts will be overflowing and we won't be whining about all the things that are gone, have gone wrong in life, but rather we will be filled with hope. Paul reminds us that we can't put our faith in outward things on our troubles and afflictions, on our ailments and our woes, because we will achieve eternal glory. And that outweighs all the temporary trials. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. In order that our house stands undivided, we need to recognize the eternal in our everyday life. Put your eyes on Jesus. Don't waver in your loyalty to Jesus the King. Prayer is a big part of bringing the kingdom of God to, into our earthly existence. Paul tells us in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. It is gratefulness and a thankful heart that will defeat the enemy of our souls. What will you choose this day? Will you choose like the Israelites to cast your eyes on what is around you, what others have, on what you feel, hear, touch, see, and taste, all things temporary? Or will you choose to put your eyes upon the things of God, the eternal things? Will you choose to follow the world and trust in worldly leaders, or will you put your whole faith and trust in the Lord? And then each day, will you choose to be thankful? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Will you pray each morning for a thankful heart? Lord, give us thankful hearts, thankful for our families, for our ability to worship, for this country, for our freedoms, for food to eat, for the gift of your love, for our salvation for being identified as part of God's family, and so much more. And it's all given from God's generous hand. Thanks be to God. Amen. I sing the almighty power of God, hymn 333.
be seated. May we pray. I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness and your great compassion. Hear our prayers. We pray for the whole church, all leaders and ministers, and all the people of God. We lift up to you especially this gathering of the faithful here at Knox Creek. Guide us, Lord, in the direction we should go. Wash us through and through, and cleanse us from our sin so that we will be attuned to your voice. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for our nation, Canada, for all nations of the earth, and for all who govern them. Help our leaders follow your will for their people and their nations, that they might rule in righteousness and mercy. Open their hearts to your word. We think especially of the Ukraine and the battlegrounds between Israel and Palestine and Hamas. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who hunger, those who thir thirst, those who cry out for justice, those who live under the threat of terror, and those without a place to lay their head. We ask that they may hear your message of joy and gladness, and that those who are broken may rejoice in your presence. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are ill, those in pain, those under stress, and those who are lonely. Give them the joy of your saving help and sustain them with your bountiful spirit. And in this moment of silence, I invite you to add your position, petitions for those the Lord has laid on your hearts this day. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we open ourselves to you, to your leadership, your guidance, your love, your grace. Help us always to be thankful for the blessings we receive and to recognize they are from your hand alone. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, you are always reaching out in love to your creatures. Help us to see your hand of fellowship, to hear your voice calling to us, and to choose to follow you with thankful hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And now Knox News. Good morning, everyone. A um, couple of things. Uh, on September the 8th at 12 o'clock, there's going to be a shower for Ashley Bernardo, who's marrying Nate Mello. And Ashley is Linda's daughter. And I'm sure a lot of you know her through the years, all the, um, especially the musical things that she has contributed. Uh, so this is kind of what we do at our church is have a, a group shower from our Knox Creek family. If you are interested in donating to a group gift, you can talk to Linda Bernardo or Debbie. <laughs> but you're um, the other thing is, I haven't got the information, but I think I kind of remember, Kirkwall's having a strawberry social on June the 19th. I believe it's a Wednesday night. So Oktoberfest sausage and hot dogs and all kinds of salads and, of course, strawberries. Trust me to remember the food part. <laughs> and you uh, may have noticed that I sent out an email 
I know there's a lot of reading in this email. Uh, we do have hard copies over here. But I urge you to take the time to look it over because we will be voting on this next Sunday at our congregational meeting. Uh, so please ta uh, take a good look at it so that next Sunday you'll be prepared to ask any questions you have or concerns that you have and then we can vote on this. And the other thing that you'll find up here is a little um, pamphlet talking about the uh, experiment in ministry this summer. So the 10 weeks when we're going to be going to other churches. And remember, it will be here sept or July the 7th and the 21st. Uh, but there are four other churches taking part. So if you pick up one of these, then it tells you exactly where each uh, Sunday of the summer and a map on how to get there. Has anybody got anything else? No? Okay. I, I just want to uh, really say again that next Sunday is so important. So if you yourselves can come, great. If you can talk to friends that you know come to church here sometime, please uh, encourage them to come so that we have everybody's opinion on this. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Prayer over the offering. The growth around us in field and garden speak of God's abundant love. What we offer to God this day spreads that abundance to those in need for Christ's sake. God of growing gardens and growing hope, receive our gifts and our gratitude this day. Bless what we bring and what we do so that we become expressions of your abundant love. In Jesus' name, amen. We are God's people, the final hymn, number 472, and it's on the screen. My brothers and sisters, keep your eyes open as you walk in God's world, alert for occasion to share God's love. And may the God who made us, the Christ who mends us, and the Spirit who gives us life walk with you each day. Amen. Amen.